Thank you, Judy, and hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining our much anticipated uh, Birds Across Virginia webinar. I think this is uh, probably the most popular webinar that we've had thus far. We've got a lot of people registered for this one. Before we get started, I'd just like to mention that our next webinar after this one is gonna explore our chapter's involvement in Virginia's conservation legislation. And that's gonna be a fascinating session, which will take place on April 27th. So we hope you can join us. Uh, but back to birds for today. I'm here at the Nature Conservancy. We are just as bird enthused as you are, but you may be wondering why does TNC care so much about birds? And I know that many of you know that we're a, a global land conservation organization, but we're also very committed to protecting biodiversity and, and birds are really some of the most biodiverse friends that we have. They're also really great indicators of the health of their habitat and they give us all kinds of important information about the ecosystem along their migratory paths. And we share our learnings and work with teammates literally across the globe to make sure that the important routes that birds need to survive stay intact. For example, our protection efforts off the eastern shore, off the eastern shore of Virginia at the Bolgeno Virginia Coast Reserve won't have as much impact if the birds that use that space lose habitat and things that they need in say the Amazon or in the Arctic where their journeys take them as well. So like everything else that we do here at TNC, it's interrelated, all of our work is interrelated. I'm really excited because today you get to hear from a handful of uh, our Virginia chapters birding experts, and they're gonna share uh, more information about what inspires them, what they love about birds, or I guess in some cases a particular bird, uh, and why every corner of our state, the great state of Virginia, is a different birding experience. Since we've got five presenters today in limited time, I can't introduce every single one of them, but you can see their backgrounds on our screen. And you can see they're a very diverse group, including uh, our senior attorney here who does all of our legal work. So we've got a great group to, to present to you. Um, and we're gonna start at the Virginia Bolgeno Coast Reserve, which is a place that some incredible birds uh, depend on to thrive. And I'd like to ask, ask Alex Wilkie, who runs our bird program there to take it from here. So Alex, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Locke. And I'm assuming you can see the screen okay since you referenced it. <laughs> okay. I can see it. I'm Great. It. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alex Wilkie, and I'm a coastal scientist uh, at the Volgenau Virginia Coast Reserve. And I'm going to kick off our birding tour across Virginia today with a really high level overview of the migratory bird work that we do here at uh, VVCR. And in doing that, I'm also going to highlight some of the iconic, what I think are the iconic species that we have out here. Um, and these are some of the same species that you could potentially see if you come visit us way out here on the coast, on the eastern shore at the southern end of the Delmarva Peninsula. So out here on the eastern shore, the Nature Conservancy owns or protects over 40,000 acres of land. So that's either through direct ownership or through protection with conservation easements that are held by the Conservancy. And you can see the distribution of those lands on the map on the left in the dark green and the lime green color coding. The rest of those colors that you see there are other conservation lands on the eastern shore. And what you might not know is that this region where we sit right in the middle of the Western Atlantic Flyway for birds is actually one of the most important places for migratory birds in the entire Western Hemisphere. So all of the coastal habitats that we have here support millions of birds on, on, throughout the annual cycle. And in a lot of cases, we support really high proportions of certain populations or species. So that makes these habitats really critical for their population resilience. And we have a couple of really great designations that celebrate that importance. We are, our barrier islands are a Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network site or WISERN site. And we are also an Audubon globally important bird area. So it's, it's no surprise really that ever since the Conservancy started working in conservation on the Eastern Shore, we have held migratory birds as one of our top priorities. And over the years, we have built a migratory bird program. Currently, that program focuses on, we have four main points of focus. First is our long-term monitoring. So this is where we work with um, all of our partners to monitor certain species, certain indicator species, so that we can have information on 
long-term trends, um, population status, population distribution, and we can feed all of that information, that data into our management in an adaptive management framework. We also have um, then our on the ground management and stewardship activities. So this is what we're doing out on our preserve, trying to manage and protect these birds. In this picture, you can see one example, which is where we put up signs and symbolic fencing to protect birds during the nesting season on the islands. We also have our education and outreach activities. And this is really, we take any, every and any opportunity to teach people about how important this place is for birds, uh, teach people about the work that we do and teach them how they can be good stewards for birds. So essentially we're trying to build a bigger community of stewards for migratory birds on the Eastern shore. And then finally, we have our research uh, program. So we work really hard with, um, in particular, our academic partners to always be thinking about, you know, what are the emerging threats? What are the most pressing conservation needs for these birds? So that we can be coming up with answers that, again, can help us adapt and guide our management activities and help us conserve these bird species throughout their entire ranges. And this program, just like all the work that we do, is really successful only because of our, of our partnerships. We have incredible partners, federal, state, local, academic organizations and, and um, agencies, and they're really critical to the work that we do. Okay, so now for some birds. Um, I, I just have a couple minutes, but I did, like I said in the beginning, wanted to show you a couple iconic species, species that I think really represent the work that we do out here. So all the species on this slide are what we call beach nesting uh, species. So they are out on our barrier islands, um, in particular during the spring and summer months, um, re reproducing. They're laying their eggs, they're raising their young, and they're really relying on those beach habitats. In the upper left here, we have two shorebird species, the piping plover and the Wilson's plover. Um, these guys are solitary nesting species. So one pair will defend a single territory out on the islands. And a lot of you are probably familiar with piping plovers because they're a federally threatened species. And we actually have about 200 pairs of those on our islands. The other three species that you see here, the least tern, the royal tern and the black skimmer, those are all what we call colonial nesting water birds. So unlike those, the shorebirds that defend a single territory, these guys like to nest together in colonies. And that, that can be just a couple pairs up to hundreds or even thousands of pairs nesting together. And there's some really great benefits for, um, of, by, of doing that, like extra eyes and ears for predators. And one characteristic uh, that all these beach nesting species share is that they really rely heavily on camouflage to protect their nests and their chicks during the nesting season. On the video on the left here, you can see coming up in the middle of the video is an American oyster catcher nest. So we were monitoring this nest and that video is just to show you how good that strategy is for protecting against predators. It also shows you how easy it would be to miss that nest if you were walking through this habitat. So that's why our management policies are so important to uh, reduce visitor disturbance to some of these nesting areas. And the photo on the right is actually a rural tern colony. Each one of those red dots is a rural tern nest. So another just great example of um, how good these birds are at camouflaging their nests and their chicks to protect themselves. Okay, and my last example is uh, one of my favorite species, the American oyster catcher. I have actually been working with this species for about 20 years here at VVCR. The bird in this picture I banded in 2003 when I was a graduate student and this species had just hatched out on one of our islands. And I took this picture last year. So this bird was 19 years old last year and it's still on Matomkin Island. We've been watching it throughout its life, come back to Matomkin to try and breed. And a really funny thing is those red bands that it has in that picture are not the ones that I put on it. So good friends and colleagues of mine in Georgia actually recaptured this bird a couple years ago in the winter time because we do know this like this bird likes to winter in Georgia um, and his bands were getting kind of old so they they gave him these nice new red bands so this is just a wonderful species it's very charismatic it's a great ambassador for you know coastal bird protection in general and it really does represent the work that we do here and our investment and commitment to protecting these birds. So I'll leave you with just a couple great resources. You can learn more about us at uh, nature.org slash VBCR. And another really excellent resource is uh, birdingeasternshore.org. If you're planning a trip to the Eastern Shore to go birding or just to get outside at our great preserves and natural areas, definitely check this resource out. 
Okay, and now we are going to move a little bit to the west, and I'm going to pass it off to Brian Van Eerden, who is the director of our Virginia Pinelands program. Thank you, Alex, and hello, everybody. I'm Brian Van Eerden. I am the director of the Virginia Pinelands program, and we're gonna move inland to the forest south of the James River, a part of the state that drains to another big estuary, the Albemarle Sound in North Carolina. And uh, this rural area, which we've named Virginia Pinelands, is sometimes called the land of pork, peanuts, and pines, the three Ps that are grown here and exported around the world. Uh, from a conservation angle, however, the area uh, could also be called the land of three S's, savannas, swamps, and streams. And these natural systems are really centers of biodiversity in the state, and they support a rich assemblage of native plants and animals, animals including hundreds of migratory um, bird uh, species, both resident and, uh, and migratory birds. And the Conservancy's long-term goal here is to uh, manage for uh, old growth forests. So large blocks of forest land that will conserve the region's representative flora and fauna. When we say managing for old growth, what we means we wanna see stands of large trees, of course, but there's much more than tree age that needs to be considered when we're managing for biodiversity. To guide our work, we need to know something about forest structure, how trees and other vegetation is arranged. And a big challenge that we have is that we don't have examples of large old forests that we can visit or pictures for reference. What we do have, however, is extensive knowledge of the habitat needs of key species, particularly birds, that can tell us a lot about the structure of the original forest where they thrived and survived. Managing suitable habitat for these bird species, but are sometimes referred to as umbrella species, can benefit many other plants and animals. And a great example of an umbrella species is one that occurs on TNC's Pine and Grove Preserve in Sussex County, the red cockaded woodpecker, what I'll refer to as RCW. It is only found in Southern US and is largely restricted to pine forests. Species is on the endangered species list and thanks to decades of research, we know many things about its biology. Like other woodpeckers, it is a cavity nesting species. However, unlike all other woodpeckers in North America, it only excavates cavities in live trees. And it typically will only create cavities in pine trees that are older than 70 years. RCWs are um, insectivores and they forage in the uh, canopy of the pine forest, and they need an open flight space uh, for movement. They also need an herbaceous ground cover uh, for the producing the insects that the woodpeckers prey upon. And finally, each breeding group needs expansive foraging area up to 200 acres. And if, if you have a large self-sustaining population of say 100 breeding groups, that's roughly 20,000 acres of habitat that's required. So if we put all this information together, all these habitat requirements, it points us to this kind of habitat structure that you see on the right, pine savanna. Large blocks of habitat like this is where you'll find red cockaded woodpeckers. The pine canopy is open, has mature cavity trees that are suitable for cavities. The flight space is open and there's a lot of light reaching the forest floor to support a grassy understory that produces the insects that move up into the pine canopy for RCWs to forage on. And where you find RCWs, you'll find a great diversity of other birds, such as prairie warbler, red-headed woodpecker, brown-headed nuthatch, to name just a few, and an incredibly rich diversity of plants on the forest floor. This system, the pine span system, is part of a much uh, broader ecosystem in North America that has one of the most biodiverse uh, plant um, um, systems in, uh, in continental uh, North America. The so red cockaded woodpeckers are rare in Virginia, primarily due to uh, the fact that there's very little available habitat. And one of the key reasons why savanna habitat is rare is because wildfire has been eliminated 
from the landscape. Lightning set wildfires are natural disturbances that have shaped the forests uh, of southeastern United States and really across the country for millions of years. Fires thin the forest and keep the canopy and mid-story open. And when we remove fire, it results in a forest that is dense and shaded with very little herbaceous vegetation. And a shot to the right, that's an example of a shaded, fire excluded uh, pine forest. No woodpeckers can be found there, RCWs and very few other bird species in forests uh, such as that. In Virginia, the best example of mature pine savannas that we have and the largest population of red cockaded woodpeckers are found on our Pine Grove Preserves, 4,000 acres in Sussex County. PNC acquired the property in 1999 with two goals in mind. One, to make sure the RCW did not go extinct and two, to launch a controlled fire program to recover pine savanna, pine savanna habitat. And we've been successful on both fronts. RCW has now filled the preserve and with our partners, we have now have 30,000 acres of land committed to pine savanna management in Southeastern Virginia. Our forest management for RCWs at Piney Grove has benefited many other plant wildlife species and the property is a demonstration site that informs pine savanna management on other lands, both private and public. And in addition to these measurable outcomes, Piney Grove is also a place where we are building an important narrative about the forest heritage of Southeastern Virginia. Now visitors to the preserve can have a time travel experience imagining what the original forests of Southeast Virginia look like. And some of my favorite times birding have been in this particular stand early in the morning, hearing red cockaded woodpeckers join in on the sunrise bird chorus. And if you're looking for a unique forest and birding experience, I encourage you to come down to Sussex County for a drive through the center of the reserve or a walk through uh, our nature trail. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to George Barlow for a story about birds in the Piedmont. All right, thank you very much, Brian. And let me get started here. All right, so here we are in the Piedmont. Um, in, and, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, birding in Central Virginia. Um, and just to start off, um, I'm a, uh, my name is George Barlow and uh, I'm an attorney in TNC's legal department and I'm based here in the Charlottesville office. And I'm gonna talk about a property that TNC protected but doesn't actually own, which is the case with uh, so many of the projects that I work on. Um, one of, I've always felt that one of TNC's great strengths is connecting people to places. And Ivy Creek Natural Area in Albemarle County has been a really important part of my life for the last 40 years. So I started birding uh, as a suburban teenager in and around Charlottesville on foot and by bicycle, um, following the creeks in the area, going up and down the hills and whatnot um, around Charlottesville, around my neighborhood in, in Albemarle County. And on these explorations, uh, I first started visiting the land that would become Ivy Creek Natural Area about the, same, about the same time as TNC acquired the first portion of the land in 1975. Um, I don't think I was trespassing at the time uh, because my parents knew uh, some of the landowners in the vicinity, uh, but I'll just leave it at that. But, uh, but those early visits were really important to me as I developed as a birder. Um, and all this land was being eyed for development in the mid 70s. And so TNC was contacted by several concerned folks in the area to see about protecting it. And so TNC acquired the land in two transactions in 1975 and then in 1981 and accumulated about 177 acres. And then TNC transferred that acreage to the city of Charlottesville and the county of Albemarle in 1981. Um, the preserve now, uh, the natural area now, while owned by the city and the county, um, uh, is managed by a private nonprofit, the Ivy Creek Foundation. And Ivy Creek does stewardship work on the property, like um, managing the autumn olive on the property, and then also has 
as education programs for visitors of all ages. Uh, since TNC uh, transferred the first 177 acres to the city and the county in 1981, more acreage has been added so that the total natural area now is about 219 acres. So, you know, back in 1981, I, I couldn't imagine that 40 years later, here I would be working for the organization that helped protect the property in the first place. So why is Ivy Creek Natural Area such a great place to visit? Um, it's a good mix of habitats. You've got some sort of montane uh, features and vegetation like mountain laurel on the property. And then you've got more Piedmont related um, vegetation on the property, plus a mix of wooded uh, waterfront and open areas. And so, um, you know, with that mix of habitats and vegetation, um, it gets a pretty rich, um, uh, a pretty rich diversity of bird life there. Also, some of the plants are interesting, even to a non-botanist like myself. I remember the first time I stumbled across uh, Shoei Orcus on the property, and I'd always thought that it only grew in the mountains. And then, lo and behold, I learned that it grows in the Piedmont too. So with the mix of habitats at Ivy Creek, there's also a good mix of bird life. And so, so a couple of my favorite, what I think of as sort of Piedmont species um, that are there are uh, prairie warbler um, that you see in some of the cut over areas on the property. Um, and you'll hear their sort of ascending kind of metallic call pretty much all over the property. There's also blue grosbeaks there. You can hear their sort of burry warbling song a good bit too. Um, you know, again, in some of the um, in some of the successional areas on the property, um, there are a couple of creeks on the property, and so Louisiana water thrush nests along the creeks. You've got green herons on the on the shorefront with the Rivanna Reservoir that runs through there, um, and then in the in the woods. There are both species of tanagers, there's yellow-throated vireos and things like that. Um, now, as the, as the seasons change, again, you get a pretty good variety of birds coming through. Uh, in the spring, um, I've, I've seen virtually every species of warbler uh, that migrates through the area there, good mix of vireos. Um, in the fall, it can be good for migrating sparrows like a Lincoln sparrow there. Um, and then in the wintertime, um, in the Virginia pines, if it's a good year for red-breasted nuthatch, they're virtually always there. Again, if it's a good year for those. Um, and then in the alders along the, uh, along the reservoir or in the yellow poplars, you can look for winter finches. And in fact, um, Ivy Creek Natural Area was sort of the center of my Christmas bird count uh, route back from 1979 to 1988 that I did through high school and college and uh, law school. Um, so in addition to its, its uh, natural history values, um, Ivy Creek Natural Area has an important historic element too. And most of the preserve encompasses what was originally called Riverview Farm. And Riverview Farm was purchased and assembled by, uh, by an emancipated enslaved person from a nearby farm, Hugh Carr. And it's one of the last examples of the Union Ridge Hydraulic Mills community of African-American farmers and craftspeople in that part of Albemarle County. Hugh Carr had a number of children, uh, five of whom went on to graduate from college, and one of whom, um, Mary Carr Greer, was an influential educator around Albemarle County. In fact, there's a nearby school uh, nearby to the natural area that was named after her. Um, and her husband, Conley, uh, Mary Carr Greer's husband, Conley Greer, was the first African-American extension agent um, in, uh, in Albemarle County. And the barn that's on the property there has been restored, um, and that was built by Mr. Greer. Um, and right now there's a restoration project underway to restore the, the uh, historic home on the property. And the property is on both the state uh, and uh, and uh, national uh, historic registers. So uh, there is good urban and suburban uh, birding around the Commonwealth and TNC has had a role 
in protecting or restoring a number of those sites. Uh, that, that includes Purcell Park over in Harrisonburg. Um, that is a stream bank uh, restoration project that TNC has done. And in Charlottesville, we have a streamside and wetland restoration project on Meadow Creek that runs through Charlottesville. It tracks the Rivanna Trail a little bit. Um, and that's a restoration project that TNC did as well. TNC in, up in Northern Virginia, TNC also had a hand in, uh, in uh, getting uh, Great Falls National Park set up too. So while TNC owns a lot of great places to go birding in Virginia uh, from the Eastern shore, Warm Springs Mountain to the Clinch River Valley. TNC does in fact transfer a lot of the land that it acquires or protects. And you know, those are some great birding sites as well. Um, in addition to um, Ivy Creek, a number of the, of the what we call cooperative projects that we've done with our agency partners over the years include Eastern Shore National Wildlife Refuge, uh, Sandy Point State Forest, uh, Big Woods down in Sussex County, a number of other wildlife management areas, and a, and a number of natural area preserves all around the Commonwealth. And so lots and lots of great birding sites that TNC has had a hand in protecting. And with that, uh, we'll move over to, the, um, over to the Allegheny Highlands and to Laurel. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, folks. Uh, I'm Laurel Shabline. I'm taking you here over to the Allegheny Highlands program where I'm based. I have been watching birds in Virginia my whole life and I started birding more formally and by ear in college. The language of bird song did not come easily to me. I struggled mightily to get some of the most common birds down. Northern Cardinal, Carolina Wren, American Robin, the ubiquitous robin, perhaps the very most challenging with its, to me, fairly indistinct melody. When I joined the Allegheny Highlands program in 2013, I finally discovered Appalachian birds more fully. My first day on the job brought me to a place called Warbler Road, where I saw and heard dozens of new species. Canada warbler, northern perula, scarlet tanager, blackburnian warbler. The vibrant colors that I saw through my binoculars that day made me feel like I was in another world. The birds on this slide, just a slice of the color palette. I was there to learn by sight, but also again by sound. They told me, ah, hear that scarlet tanager? It sounds like an American robin, but with a sore throat but not to be confused with the rose-breasted grosbeak, a robin with voice lessons. I love reflecting on my very first extraordinary day of discovery on the job. And since then, when I thought that it might take a lifetime to learn the songs of my new neighbors, I've come to know them very well. I've not only gotten the opportunity to study these birds, I've had the pleasure of contributing to creating the habitat they need to survive. There are over 100 species identified as priority birds for conservation concern in the Appalachians. And these two species, Cerulean warbler and golden wing warbler top that list. These declines are steep, 70% for cerulean, 66% for golden wing warbler over the last 60 year period. If you look specifically at the Appalachian population, it's even more grim with up to 98% population decline. These two species have near opposite habitat needs. Put very simply, ceruleans occupy mature forests that contain gaps in the canopy while golden wing warblers require very young forest on the edge of mature forest. Personally, I love these two birds in their own right, but this is an indicator of a much bigger issue of widespread diversity loss in these mountains, affecting uh, all manner of plants and animals. The Appalachians is indeed one of the most biodiverse regions in the world. 
there are many drivers of this. One, a long history of frequent and repeated disturbance, including grazing, storms, and fire. And in just a blink of geologic time over the last century or a little more, humans have suppressed fire and virtually eliminated it from our landscape. And by removing this disturbance, we have allowed the forest to homogenize to a degree. But by putting fire back on the landscape safely, we see a mosaic of forest conditions return. This mosaic should include mature forest and young forest, open canopy and closed canopy and everything in between, supporting our two very charismatic warblers with distinctly different needs. These birds and other species have adapted to fit perfectly and very specifically into the puzzle that is a healthy and varied forest. And the forest has adapted for millennia with fire. This year, the Conservancy is celebrating 60 years of good fire, meaning that we've had our hand in fire management nearly as long as we've had a hand in protecting land and water. And looking ahead, fire is really the only management tool that we can apply at the appropriate landscape scale to hopefully reverse losses and bring species like golden wing warbler and the RCWs back from the brink. That first day on the job when I was learning all of these birds, it was so that we could monitor their response to controlled burns. And in the last 10 years of surveys, we've seen an increase in diversity in and around the preserve as we are able to put more and more fire on the ground. But Again, it's not just about the birds. Birds are considered indicators that reflect habitat quality and changes in the forest structure, providing information on the overall condition. More bird diversity equals more habitat diversity equals more overall species diversity. And we're just getting started. This year we have uh, a record burn block on the books for well over 5,000 acres here in the Allegheny Highlands in late winter, uh, early spring. And just weeks later is the very best time to come visit, not just to hear and see dozens of warbler species celebrating their return to Warm Springs Mountain Preserve, but also to see and to smell the wildflowers emerging from a lightly charred forest floor and to look closely for little acorns finally germinating in the long awaited post fire conditions and learn a little bit more about burning for the birds. And now we are gonna hear from Zach back at the Eastern shore about some tools to aid in all of your delightful discoveries this spring. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Zach Holton, and I'm Coastal Biologist Technology Specialist at VVCR. Um, I help Alex with all the migratory bird aspects, but I also take on a, a technology component. So I'm going to talk to you today about how to use technology to become better at identifying birds and also contribute to citizen science. And just a little background here. Um, I, I do quite a bit with technology. So I'm a certified drone pilot. We create apps for our data collection. We are tracking birds that are uh, radio tagged through a modus tower. We do a lot with trail cameras. So anyway, uh, we can become better at our work. We're trying to implement that. And today I'm really just going to focus on two apps and they're both by Cornell Lab of Ornithology and that's the Merlin app and the eBird app. And I love books, but it's not really practical to bring those into the field. And uh, you can spend a lot of money on books, which are great, but these apps are actually free and most of us have a smartphone now. 
So today I'm actually going to give you a demo of how easy it is to use these apps. So we're first going to start with identification. Merlin has over 7,000 species in this app that are free for you to use. So um, you can really use it just about anywhere in the world. So we're first going to click this, which will give us a key to use, and it uses your location and your date, which will help it narrow down what species are probable. And we're going to pick a medium-sized bird. And then you get to pick the colors that you're seeing on the bird. So we're going to pick red, brown, and also black. And then next, it's going to ask us where we're seeing this bird. So we saw it on the ground. And it will auto-populate a list of likely species. And so I was actually thinking of American robin. So you can see this, you can enter it directly into eBird to keep track of your sightings, or you can use it to learn more about the bird. If I click the eye, we can see photos, we can read a description about the species. And then what's also really great is you can click the sound and hear songs and also the calls of the species. And then we can also click the map to see where the species is likely to be seen, just like a field guide. Um, they also have a way to use photos to ID. I'm not very good at taking photos of birds with my phone, so I'm not going to show you that, but it's pretty easy. The one I really enjoy using is a sound ID. And so I'm going to show you a recording that I did actually last summer but it will auto detect the species in the list. And as they come through, it will bring them into this bottom box. And you can tell it's really hard to hear because I'm using my phone, but it's still able to actually pick up these species in real time. And this is a new feature and really handy, uh, especially coming into the spring, we all need a refresher. So there you can hear the Carolina Wren. Carolina Wren again. So that's a really handy feature to have since oftentimes you are just listening to birds. And then if you want to, you can go in and just explore the birds of the world. You can go through and read those descriptions and it's available to anyone in the app store. So in conjunction with that, we're going to talk about eBird, which is a great way to record your sightings. So when you open it up, it gives you this. You select the date, the time you're actually going to record. And I'm just giving an example. So I'm going to just record a couple of Canada geese. And you can actually click on it, enter more descriptions if you want, breeding codes, number. And this is all based off the species that you're most likely to see, but occasionally you'll get a rare bird. And you can actually go down and turn on the rarities so it will show you every species. You can also search for the species you're actually looking for. And we're going to stop our checklist. And first off, you have to choose a location. And so you submit where you are. It is using your phone GPS if you allow it, number of observers how long you've been out. And it will actually record that information for you. And then you select what kind of checklist. This is an incidental, we weren't out birding on purpose. So I'm not re even recording all species that I heard or saw. And what's great, once you submit this, you can go to my eBird and actually see all your records in one easy place which is a great way to keep track of. You can see by county, by state, or even at the world level. So you can see I'm not, I'm not the best at keeping up with this, but I do try to record. And what I really love about this app is exploring. So you can go to the Explore tab, you can look for a species or a place to go bird watching. And so it will show your area, but it will work anywhere in the world that you have service. And you can see where I am is the blue and white dot. And I click the red dot, which is Oyster, which is a TNC property here on the shore. And so you can see all the species that are likely to be seen there. And so it'll bring it in. You can actually look for a certain species 
you can see all time or what's actually been recorded in the last 30 days. What's really important about this are the little graphs. The blue, the thicker the blue line, the more likely you are to see that during certain times of the year. So it's a great way to find new species and find new locations to go bird watching. And if you don't know how to get to this place, I can easily click the blue, or sorry, the green icon in the top, and it will open your map service and tell you how to get there. So it's a great tool to use while traveling. And also what's really important is all your records can be used by scientists for research. And so that brings us into the citizen sci science side of things. There are plenty of opportunities to get out and contribute to science through birding. And these are just some of the examples. Uh, the Nature Conservancy in Virginia actually has a volunteer coordinator, which will help you find opportunities to volunteer. And her name's Jen Dolk, and you can actually sign up on our website to get a newsletter of these opportunities. And one that I wanted to point out was Wimber Watch on the Eastern Shore in May, where we sit out in the evenings and count Wimberls as they migrate north. And thank you. All right, well, thank you, Zach. Also, Alex, Brian, George, and Laurel, uh, really nice presentations, everybody. So now it's time for questions from our viewers. Um, Alex, the first question I'm gonna um, pass it over to you. And the question is, um, will offshore wind power stations threaten migratory birds? Great, thanks, Judy. Um, that's a great question and uh, definitely a hot topic of research right now in the bird world. Um, what we do know is that, yes, these the offshore wind farms do have the potential to impact birds that are using the same system. Um, in a couple different ways, you know, there's the potential that there could be direct mortality of the birds because of collision with the actual infrastructure that's being put out, um, a, you know, in uh, on the water. Um, there's also the potential that birds that are using those areas could be displaced from where they want to be. So where they want to migrate through or maybe where they want to forage. Um, so that could reduce their fitness and maybe even result in mortality as well. Um, and then there's also the threat that that just the infrastructure itself, you know, can degrade the habitat and, and some of the surrounding habitat that the birds need. So, um, you know, we know that there's that potential and we have some information to tell us about where the overlap is and what the exposure risk is to certain species in certain areas. Um, we also know that we need a lot more information. So there are it, there's a ton of activity in terms of offshore wind development, especially in the Northeast, right off of our coast here in Virginia, and it's sort of moving its way south. So um, luckily there's the, the technology that we have now for tracking birds and getting the type of spatial information that we need to answer some of these questions is, is great and it's improving every day. So, um, you know, we, we're looking forward to getting a lot more answers on exactly what that impact is gonna be. And there's also some really um, big initiatives to bring scientists together from, you know, throughout the Atlantic coast to talk about what the questions are that we need to be asking, how we can answer them, how we deal with cumulative impacts to these birds. Um, and we will be, we're embarking on a couple of projects here at VCR to think about how some of uh, some projects might affect the birds that use this system right here in our backyard. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, thanks also for your leadership uh, around um, this issue. So um, the next question is uh, for Brian, will be for Brian. And the question is, are the red cockaded woodpeckers at Piney Grove making their own nests now, or are they still relying on the nest boxes that we had installed? Yeah, great question. Uh, when we, a little bit of background. So when we acquired Piney Grove, in 1999, we had just 12 birds. And um, and one of the limiting factors for population growth, growth for red cockade woodpeckers is this cavity availability. And it takes a red cockade woodpecker up to two years to excavate a cavity. And we have a really small population with all the 
the energy that's required to excavate cavities, um, it becomes a real hurdle for a small population to build its own cavity. So to overcome that, we can, as, as land managers, we can actually install artificial cavities. So we can climb a tree, a big tree, put in what looks like a, a bluebird box uh, into a cavity that we excavate in the tree, sort of patch all that up, and that becomes a, um, an available uh, cavity for, uh, for an RCW. We did a lot of that for the first couple of years, um, and it was very successful. And that was accompanied by bringing juvenile birds from a donor population in South Carolina. It was another thing that we did to overcome our, our small population size. We brought in uh, juvenile birds. So the, the, the recruitment of juvenile birds, as well as the availability of artificial cavities that led to a surge in our population. And right now the population is large enough. There's enough sort of woodpeckers out there that they don't need for us to install artificial cavities anymore, sort of taking care of their, uh, their homes on their own right now. Great, thanks, thanks Brian for telling that great story. Um, and um, uh, Laurel, I'm gonna um, have, an, have the next question go to you. And I think this is a cool question because it's asking about two birds who have very different habitat needs. So excited to hear your answer for this. So the question is, what size contiguous forest do cerulean and golden wing warblers need? And then there's some, some question about altitude as well. Yeah, great question. Uh, the, the cerulean and golden wing both were, were trying to understand all of the nuances of what makes good habitat for both of these birds. And I think in short, we're really not sure because it varies so greatly from region to region, state to state. Um, for example, I can speak specifically to, uh, you know, Bath and Highland County are two of the places where we work with these species or we work with partners who are really heavily invested in working with these species. And so golden wing warbler, for example, is known to have um, more widely known to have a threshold of around uh, 1800 feet. Uh, but in Bath County, we're really seeing that they're, they're having a preference for, you know, a 2000 to 2500 uh, foot threshold. And so just very, very different from place to place and still understanding. Um, both of the birds, both of these birds really require being in or for golden wing adjacent to these big forested blocks. But again, that's something that really varies from place to place. Over here in the Allegheny Highlands, we often refer to it as the, the big green blob on the map. The preserve sort of is embedded in this landscape of George Washington Jefferson National Forests, as well as lots of state lands and other protected lands. Um, so we, we've got a, a higher concentration of these species that require those larger blocks here in the Allegheny Highlands. Thanks, Laurel. Um, George, I'm gonna put this question to you um, because in your, uh, in your avocation as birder, you're also our attorney. And so you handle a lot of our deals with federal agencies and understand how we work with them. Um, so the question is, does TNC collaborate with other organizations and government agencies in the development of wildlife corridors along migratory routes? Well, we do, but some of the more scientific folks on this call might be able to answer this a bit more. But certainly in my experience in, in, um, in uh, structuring some of these transactions, you know, we certainly have, um, you know, we have preserves that we own. There are larger protected areas too. Um, and we do tend, at least the way that I understand is, you know, we do tend to focus on corridors in between those areas. And we might not protect them by acquiring them. We might um, we're gonna do a conservation easement over those, you know, over those corridors. Um, there are other, you know, uh, means that are, you know, in the toolbox to try to protect those lands. And we do work with our agency partners to help identify those. Um, and certainly for acquisition, um, 
sometimes you know, we'll understand from a federal or state agency that there's a particular property that they would like to own or they'd like to see a conservation easement over. And that enables our land protection folks like Brian to start approaching those landowners to figure out how to do that. And then, and then from Brian, it goes to my desk to essentially write a lot of documents. Okay, great. Um, and then Zach, I'm gonna ask you this question, but then this will be sort of our, uh, we'll, we'll let all the panelists weigh in on this. What is the correct pronunciation of the bird whose name is spelled P-L-O-V-E-R? I was afraid you were gonna do that. <laughs> uh, I say plover, but I, I have the excuse, I tell people I'm from the South, I say a lot of things wrong. So uh, I've heard it both ways. Uh, I don't know if, if you can say one is correct or not. I, from Northern partners, I usually hear plover more so than plover. But anyway, yeah, there's a couple species where uh, people say it differently. So I, I accept all. <laughs> Anybody else want to weigh in with a strongly held opinion on that? What about that big woodpecker? The woody Hiliated, pileated, that's a good one. Uh, perula or per perula is how some people say it. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it's more regionality or what. When I was uh, starting out as a botanist, my mentor said, I was struggling with how to pronounce um, scientific names. He said, Brian, just say it with confidence. That's the right way to say it. Okay. My internet's unstable. My internet is a little unstable, even though I'm in our Nature Conservancy office. So I apologize for that little blip. You're back. Um, the uh, uh, questions that we didn't get to will be answered, um, and they'll, the uh, answers will be in that email that you get from us next week. Um, there were a ton of questions about visitation. So we will be sending to you um, information about how to visit our preserves, about field trips that we have planned for this spring. So definitely stay tuned for that. We're so excited and really looking forward to seeing you in the woods. Um, so with that, Locke Ogans, Virginia State Director, I'd love to pass it over to you for um, a few closing thoughts. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get my camera back on here. Yeah, great. Thank you, Judy. And thank you all for a really informative presentation. I don't know if the presenters have been able to follow the chat, but I think you did a great job today. And um, I hope everyone on the call has enjoyed this. Uh, and I want you to know that we are so grateful for the support you give to us at the Nature Conservancy. This, you saw today what that support means and what happens as a result of that. And uh, I just couldn't be more honored to work with such a great group of colleagues and dedicated colleagues. And I couldn't be more thankful for all of you who make that work possible. And of course, this isn't everything we do with birds in Virginia. It would take a lot longer to do that. And as Judy just said, we will send follow-up information to you in an email and are gonna be more than happy to try to answer all the questions that were, uh, were posed today. Uh, and then I just wanna say, don't forget to mark your calendars for our next webinar. We're going to be talking about Virginia's conservation legislation, and that's super important and weaves into everything you heard today about how do we protect nature uh, for the benefit of both of the birds and all the other things in nature, but also for people and access to nature. And so with that point, I think we'll sign off for today. Really, really appreciate your attendance. And again, thanks to the panelists for a great presentation. Everyone have a good afternoon and Get out there and enjoy some birding. Bye. <laughs>